This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. In light of Francis's war against the Apostolic Mass, I thought it might be prudent to dig into the archives and find something enlightening for you today. There's been a lot of talk in traditional Catholic circles about Paul VI's famous remarks about the smoke of Satan entering into the church. We've been told for years but that through various interpretations of that warning of the popes that this is has to do actually apparently with Paul VI's thoughts on many different things and they range from early signs of the uh, Ted McCarrick problem we'll call it that was showing up in the church in the 1970s to the takeover of the Second Vatican Council and its implementation by the worst of the modernists to unbelievably claims that Paul VI was apparently uh, talking about Archbishop Lefebvre and the, at the time, new Society of St. Pius X. It turns out that none of that is actually true. But the truth is much more simple and points actually at what Francis and Roche are doing now liturgically in the church. For content, our context rather, let's get Paul VI's words about the smoke of Satan. And because of how much of this, how many quotes I'm using here, I'm going to just go back to, you know, the Belloc image right here on screen, <laughs> you know, going back a little bit in time here, it's stylistically, so we're not misinterpreting what he's saying here, or misrepresenting what he's saying, I want to be accurate. So, Paul VI was writing on the 29th of June, 1972, on the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul. It was a momentous feast day in the conciliar church, if Father Malachi Martin's allegations in Windswept House are true about related events that had taken previously in you know prior years prior to even the council on the feast of saints peter and paul if we're to take them seriously the full letter was that i'm referring you here to was eventually published in 2018 in italian in a book on paul the sixth but excerpts and other letters pointing to the anxiety paul the sixth was apparently facing over his actions and his part in things are readily available in english because a letter like this eventually gets translated at least in part which is the case here the statement about the smoke of Satan from one of his personal letters is as follows. You rarely hear the full statement, which I have here. We would say that through some mysterious crack, no, it's not mysterious, through some crack, the smoke of Satan has entered the church of God. There is doubt, uncertainty, problems, unrest, dissatisfaction, confrontation. The church is no longer trusted. We trust the first pagan prophet we see who speaks to us in some newspaper, and we run behind him and ask him if he has the formula for true life. I repeat, doubt has entered our conscience, and it entered through the windows that should have been opened to the light, science. It was thought that, after the council, sunny days would come for the history of the church. Nevertheless, what came were days of clouds, of storms, of darkness, of searching, of uncertainty. We try to dig abysses instead of covering them, end quote. That's an interesting thing to remember here. The smoke of Satan is at least in part doubt caused by the church's embrace of secular sciences, which began in full force during the council. Remember what part of the purpose of the Second Vatican Council was, to open the church to the, to the, to the world to let some fresh air in. And that was at the beginning, at a time when these secular sciences were really taking off in the esteem of the public. That is something to remember here. And it may seem remarkable to many, especially since the statements later by John Paul II and others about evolution suddenly becoming acceptable to adhere to for Catholics, despite the church previously fighting vociferously against that theory of the scientists, because previously the hierarchy understood what would happen. And we've seen some of the you know folks like Christopher Hitchens talking about, you know, if you accept evolution, then you can't, then the concept of original sin becomes incoherent. That's, he said that to a Catholic priest on television once, and it was hard to argue with him. But in theory, anyway, this is what Paul VI is saying, at least in part. The smoke of Satan comment wasn't limited to that, as evidenced by other letters Paul VI had sent in that same time period. He was going through serious troubles watching the implementation of the Novus Ordo and the sudden appearance of clown masses, Elvis masses, John Denver masses, and worse. Because not only did he mention science in that excerpt, he mentioned the council in an expectation that Vatican II 
would bring a renewal into the life of the church, that it would bring a new springtime. Paul VI saw that it hadn't had that effect at all. In a letter dated about a week before the letter that I just, where he describes the smoke of Satan entering the church, Paul VI penned a poem called Terror and Ecstasy, which is about the consequences for himself about becoming Pope. It's extremely short. Here it is in full. Quote, Perhaps the Lord called me to the service, not for me to adopt any attitude, or so that I would govern and save the church from its difficulties, but so that I would suffer something for the church, and so it be made clear that it is him and no one else who guides it and saves it. End quote. That sounds like he had buyer's remorse of some kind, but you don't have to take a couple of excerpts from 50-year-old letters and my interpretation of them at face value. In 2008, a now mostly forgotten interview surfaced with Cardinal Noah, who was a friend of Paul VI, and he told the Catholic world what the smoke of Satan reference was about. He also dispelled notions that Paul VI was mostly unhappy, which I know conflicts with what I just told you. Now, many of you will know people who are deeply unhappy or suffer from the weight of some anxiety-causing cross that they carry through life, but who put on a happy and serene front for others. I kind of suspect that's what happened here. That interview with Cardinal Noah was translated back in 2008 by Father Z and has been on his blog for 14 years now. I'll give you the interview verbatim. I'll break it up some just because reading the, you know, interviewer response stuff that gets really tedious, but I'll break it up for you here, but it will be verbatim. And I'll do, I'll give it to you verbatim since it's pretty short, including things that don't seem related simply because they paint the picture between his personal letters and what Cardinal Noah has to say of a Pope that was conflicted watching the revolution he led in the church take life and leave him behind while still trying to maintain the sort of stoic face needed for leadership in the church during times like that. Now, something to remember here, Cardinal Noah was by no stretch of the imagination a traditionalist, not in the slightest. He was no Athanasius Schneider. He was no Vigano, not even a conservative Novus Ordo type like Cardinal Burke. He was fully on board with the changes that came after Vatican II. Bear that in mind. From Father, C's and from Father Z's translation, the translator asks who Paul VI was as a man. Now he remembers his time working with Paul VI. And the Cardinal's response is here, quote, a real gentleman, a saint. I remember still how he lived the Eucharistic mystery with passion and participation. When I think of him, I tear up, but not in the way of a hypocrite. I am truly moved. I owe him a great deal. He taught me a lot. He lived and paid a great price for the church. I remember it splendidly. Once the Holy Father said to me, personally and in a very tender way, how the MC, the Master of Ceremonies, ought to carry out his role in that particular historical period. He came into the sacristy. I drew near and he said, the MC must foresee everything and take in everything on himself. He has the task of making the Pope's road smoother. End quote. Cardinal Noah was the MC for the masses Paul VI was going to say for some time at that time and for other things as well. But also it's pretty clear that Paul VI rightly understood himself to be the master of ceremonies of Vatican II's implementation and the council. That explains some of his remorse from his letters that I started this with. But let's continue. The interviewer asks if Paul VI said anything beyond that. The response from the Cardinal is this, quote, he affirmed that the spirit of the MC must not be shaken up by anything, large or small. And that may be his own personal problems. An MC, he stressed, must remain also the master of himself and be the Pope's shield so that the Holy Mass can be celebrated in a dignified way for the glory of God and his people. Paul VI took up the liturgical reform called for by the council with pleasure, end quote. Paul VI was obviously excited about the liturgical reform, the new Mass, and the historic record bears that out. That's why he promulgated it in the first place. That's why he pushed an early version that Cardinal Ottaviani said would get Paul VI denounced as a formal heretic if he promulgated it. For those of you who say we can't you know, judge a pope in anything he does, Cardinal Ottaviani apparently thought you could under certain circumstances, including trying to promulgate a new Mass that was Protestant in nature. But anyway, the interviewer asks, if Paul VI was a sad man with obvious buyer's remorse after the council. I remember the tone of Paul VI's letters I started this with. Cardinal Noah tells us that it's a lie, that Paul VI was sad and despondent during the latter years of his papacy, that he wasn't sad at all. Quote, a lie. He was a good and gentle father, a gentleman and a saint. 
At the same time, he was saddened by the fact of having been left alone by the Roman Curia. But I'd prefer not to talk about that, end quote. He's asked if Paul VI was serene about and about what the smoke of Satan was. Paul VI was apparently happy in his outward appearance. Quote, he was. Do you know why? Because he also affirmed that whoever serves the Lord cannot ever be sad. He, was ser- he has served him especially in the sacrifice of the Mass. But you, from Petrus, the original Italian outlet that Father Z translated, have gotten a real scoop here because I am in a position to reveal for the first time what Paul VI desired to denounce with that statement, the smoke of Satan statement. Here it is. Papa Montini, for Satan, meant to include all those priests or bishops and cardinals who didn't render worship to the Lord by celebrating badly, mal celebrando, holy mass, because of an errant interpretation of the implementation of the Second Vatican Council. He spoke of the smoke of Satan because he maintained that those priests who turned holy mass into dry straw in the name of creativity, in reality, were possessed of the vainglory and the pride of the evil one. So the smoke of Satan was nothing other than the mentality which wanted to distort the traditional and liturgical canons of the Eucharistic ceremony, end quote. Paul VI thought the liturgical chaos that came after the council and which was frankly not gone away was from Satan. That is the smoke of Satan, not Archbishop Lefebvre, not other issues. The divisions in the church after the council, the falling away of religious and priests from their consecrated and ordained lives, all of it, and even Paul VI's remarks about science causing doubt in people to leave the church, all of it comes from liturgical chaos. Cardinal Noah says the following, quote, He, Paul VI, condemned craving to be in the limelight and the delirium of almighty power that they were following the council at the liturgical level. Mass is a sacred ceremony, he often repeated. Everything must be prepared and studied adequately, respecting the canons. No one is Dominus, Lord of the Mass. Sadly, in many, after Vatican II, not many understood him and Paul VI suffered this, considering the phenomenon to be an attack of the devil. True liturgy renders glory to God. Liturgy must be carried out always, and and no matter what the decorum, even a sign of the cross poorly made is synonymous with scorn and sloppiness. Alas, I repeat, after Vatican II, it was believed that everything, or nearly, was permitted. Now it is necessary to recover, and in a hurry, the sense of the sacred in the R. Celebrandi, before the smoke of Satan completely pervades the church. Thanks be to God, we have Pope Benedict XVI, whose mass and his liturgical style are an example of correctness and dignity. End quote. Like I said, this is from 2008. Remember what he said about even a sign of the cross being made sloppily. How many people, when they pray, quickly make the sign of the cross? Probably every one of us, or most of us. Let's remember what this cardinal said back then, because despite the fact that he was no friend of the traditional movement, he's not wrong in that statement. So let's remember that in our own lives moving forward. But remember what we've seen in the implementation of Traditionus Custodis, and the supporting documents since the Council. And remember, we are approaching a Marian feast day. Francis and his henchmen have the habit of issuing documents or wicked statements on those feast days in particular. So there's a chance that we'll get more liturgical suppression, more liturgical chaos that is of the smoke of Satan on that day. It's not a guarantee. I'm making no hard predictions there, but it could very well happen. Since Traditionis Custodis, we've seen not only the apostolic mass suppressed at the diocesan level at, by Rome, or in the process of being so, we've seen the worst examples of liturgical chaos in the Novus Ordo permitted to continue. Attempts to make the Novus Ordo more sacred, more reverent, and more traditional have been outright banned in the name of rigidity in many places in the church. One wonders what Paul VI thinks about all this now. One thing is for sure, though. History is full of examples of leaders of revolutions and them having some measure of regret for their actions after they've gotten what they've worked for. That doesn't absolve Paul VI for his part in the chaos that we live under now, but it does help us understand that Francis is actually the most anti-Vatican II pope we've had, not because he opposes the council's documents overtly and with his words, but because it has been demonstrated numerous times that he just sort of makes things up that the council allegedly wanted and implements that strange interpretation of things. And that's why I call him the spirit of Vatican II, Pope, the embodiment of the spirit of Vatican II. But also remember, the spirit of Vatican II is the natural outgrowth of the, doc- of the council itself. If you read the documents, there are breaks from what the church taught before the council in those documents. People try to dance around that issue, but unfortunately it's true. 
And because of that, I'm, I'm left wondering what the council fathers, you know, how they would have viewed the Pacamama procession in 2019 or the Canadian demons of the air consecration that happened more recently and that stuff with a great Western grandmother that Francis participated in just last week or the week before. So what do you think about this? Was Cardinal Noah and Paul VI's letters, were they helpful in clarifying the meaning of the infamous smoke of Satan comment? Let me know in the comments, please, what you thought of this. Like and subscribe if you haven't, it really does help. Share this on social media if you can, that really does help as well. Thanks to the patrons of this channel for supporting the work of Return to Tradition. Because of them that I have the ability, the time to find these kind of articles for you that take a lot of research to dig and find and bring them to you. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.